just wanted to say too, the, so well that I uh, mentioned the 100 billion galaxies, um, might think they're exaggerating a bit, but actually the executive model says hundreds of billions of galaxies. So, no exaggeration there. But anyway, getting back, so last week, I got the introduction and what science is and what it's not. Um, main thing I just like to remind everybody up from last week is you cannot follow the science, we cannot trust in science, we follow and we trust people using the science. Um, and also, again, you know, just gonna remind you guys why this is so important to me is that we've got kids that are getting ready to go into high school and college, um, we've got grandkids getting ready to go into high school and college. They're going to be bombarded with this stuff. And the best way for us to be able to talk to them is maybe to understand a little bit of it ourselves. So, anyway, what we got last week was we got through the peach ethic. Uh oh, what a press. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's different control. It has one more button, so now I'm going to be completely lost. <laughs> Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, is there a, yeah, there is. Okay, there's a really good point on this part. Okay. So we started with the peach epic, right? And we just we figured out that peach epic is pretty much where secular people start. Peach epic isn't really the fair place to start because there's already something when we start with the peach epic. So we never get an explanation of how nothing became something. But uh, we're just, it doesn't make sense to work before in that case, so we're just going to not worry about before the beach epic. We'll do what is a second to do and just talk about from the beach epic. So the peach basically was that little peach sized trillion Kelvin ball that when it bang, became a big plasma cloud. And in that plasma, then we got some little, the first atoms formed, atoms of gas, mainly hydrogen, helium. You will hear some people say, uh, Gas, but they have an all just popping like deuter deuterium. No, it's not right. Lithium. No, well, lithium is the other third thing I think might be part of it. Um, but I see deuterium. Yeah, deuterium in there. Deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. So um, we'll, we might talk a little bit about what isotopes are when we get into radiometric dating. That'll be next week. But uh, so those are the gases they think form first. Of course, those gases, you know, the, the molecules exert so much gravity that they got so dense, they then created nuclear fusion star stars. Um, and this is the second model. So we got two stars forming. So we had the gases kind of beginning here, and then there's just gases for about, you know, so we were only in the first second there. Then it took 100 seconds for the plasma to start turning into these gas atoms. And then for about 100 million years, nothing. Have because those gases are just kind of swirling, expanding, and cooling, right? And that's then after about 100 million years is when they were finally dense enough to start stars. So now we got stars. We're taking a couple giant leaps of faith. We're taking on faith that that peach just came out of nowhere. Uh, we're taking on faith that all of the mass that we know of in the universe was contained in that peach. We're taking it on faith that that just kind of went bang within a couple seconds or 100 seconds gas molecules. Then we had to take on faith that these first stars could start to form. So now we've got stars. So what does any self-respecting star need to have to call itself cool and be part of a good galaxy? It needs to have a solar system, right? Not all stars have them, but the cool ones do. However it does, so where do the planets in the solar system come from? So as it turns out, you know, the, the solar system, the, the you know, galaxies don't start forming, so you get stars at about 100 million years. But galaxies and such don't really start for about four or 500 million years after that. Because we need time for these stars to cluster up. Uh, you know, typically galaxies, you know, the theory is there's a black hole in the center of them holding together. Um, but they need time to cluster up from these galaxies and form, if the, the stars that do have them, form their own solar systems, form stuff, form planets around them. So, and the way that works according to the model, is if you've had about 400 billion years, now some of the first stars are dying out. They're, while they've been burning, they've been taking those hydrogen and helium atoms and making many of the other atoms that we see on our periodic table. Not all of them yet, but making many of them. And then when those stars die and explode, well, all those atoms now spew out into, the, into the, in space. And those atoms then eventually get into orbits of neighboring stars. Right? So now you have these stars that have all these gas atoms just orbiting around them. 
as they orbit around them, they start to collide and actually kind of coalesce, kind of get built bigger and bigger, right? So we can kind of see that for a little bit. Uh, you guys will experience dust in your homes. You get little tiny, so the gas atoms make little dust particles. Dust particles start forming like dust bunnies. And we see that static gets your dust, your dust particles to conglomerate, basically, and make bigger little dust bunnies. They take it one step further, though, and then eventually those dust bunnies have to become little tiny rocks, and they call them planetesimals. So planetesimals are where planets are born. And now those, as they're rotating or, around, or revolving around the sun, they keep banging together, keep bumping together, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As they're going around the sun, it also makes them spin, right? So that spinning makes them round in shape, makes them, makes them circular uh, or spherical, and then they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So there's the idea for planets. So basically, this is just a little drawing of our solar system. It's not really what they're trying to describe, but I can use it to describe it. So you know, we've got our planets, but what I want your attention on is see the little, we have an asteroid belt that goes in between Mars and Jupiter. And that's in our solar system, we have that. So if thinking about that, let's uh, give you the next slide. So the idea is that these things are, as they are going around the sun, bumping against each other and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Well, these aren't because we've seen that here. We don't know, you know, those just stay as rocks for some reason. But the idea behind planetesimals is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger until they have planets. So anybody think of what the, you know, what the first problem I thought it was with that. What happens if you take two rocks and smack them together? Yeah, you get more like, that's a bit exaggerated, it's planets already, but that's the idea. When rocks hit together, they don't stick together. Static no longer can keep them together. Their own gravity cannot keep them together. Um, and, you know, the answer to this is, well, you get the one planetesimal, and it just keeps collecting the dust and getting bigger and bigger. It's not the two big rocks connect. It's that the one planetesimal keeps collecting more dust particles and getting bigger, right? Because the dust particles stick to it. So why in our solar system, with all of that dust out there, did we only get eight planets? I'm sorry guys, Pluto's not a planet. And there's a bunch of reasons why. There's a reason they get them, and there's real reasons why they don't call it a planet. But uh, so we have eight planets, so we only get eight planetesimals out of that, and they got all the dust, and no other, no other rocks of any size formed, because the pebbles, even as the planets are growing, even the pebbles are going to bounce off them, right? You have to have dust particles small enough for static or some kind of force to keep them together. Um, so, really, to me, this isn't quite as far fetched as how stars form, but still, you got to take a pretty good leap of faith to accept planets form this way. But that's not the only problem. Let's assume all of our planets form. There's, you can go through each of the planets in our system. You know, all the way from, we got Mercury here, all the way out to Neptune is the last planet. There are reasons that Pluto doesn't need to be a planet. Um, but there are reasons why each of these planets really shouldn't exist according to laws of physics and according to the Big Bang model. They should not be able to exist where they're at. Um, interest of time, I'm just gonna go through the last four because they're the biggest, easiest to talk about, um, most fun. So Jupiter. We all know Jupiter got the big red dot, right? It's a big gas giant. It's the biggest planet in our system. Um, and it's, it's not really the same kind of planet as, say, our Earth is. Our Earth is real dense rock. Jupiter is very dense, but it's gas that's swirling around. It's still very dense, very big, has a lot more gravity than we have. Um, and that, as it turns out, causes a problem for it. And this is something that came out of, out of the Big Bang idea. This wasn't something the creationists came up with. In fact, it's got what's called a migration problem. And I'm sorry, guys, that you can't read this very well on the screen. I'm, gonna, I'm going through all the words anyway as I talk. So, um, But the migration problem is basically this. When you have planets revolving around the sun, right, the sun is exerting gravity, and the planet's also exerting some gravity. So there is an attraction trying to pull these planets into the sun. As long as they have a good, fast enough, a good enough momentum in their orbit, what do you guys know about when you go real fast in a circle? Anybody wrote the Gravitron in the fair? It pulls you out, right? So as long as you have the right orbit around the, you know, the right speed, right momentum and velocity around the sun, that's pulling you out, gravity's pulling you in, and you stay in your orbit. 
And that is another, you know, I didn't really talk about in this presentation, but does that sound like random chance or design to you guys? <laughs> it's the odds of planets, and especially our planet, getting right where it is to create or to sustain life is just astronomically large. I didn't really get into that and wish I kind of had, but um, the fact that these planets, if they're off just a bit, they go haywire, right? Well, it turns out Jupiter, when they run the math, isn't where it needs to be to survive and stay in orbit around the sun. It's not going fast enough for its distance from the sun. It should be, its orbit should be deteriorating faster than it is when they run the math on it. And Saturn actually suffers from the same migration problem. Not as bad, because Saturn doesn't have, isn't as big, it's not going to cruise into the sun as fast as Jupiter. But they figure by the mathematics, if these had formed four and a half billion years ago, they should have crashed into the sun about two billion years ago. <laughs> so, but yet they're there and we're not noticing that much deterioration. We do see deteriorations in orbits. We also see some orbits that we think are actually broadening. So, um, but then Saturn, Saturn provides some of the more fun stuff too. Saturn's got several moons. I forget how many, some of you guys might know, but I don't remember how many exactly, but, um, Two that I like are kind of Enceladus. So Enceladus, just a small little moon around Saturn, but pound for pound, the brightest object in our in the sky. We don't really see it. That, I mean, sorry, second brightest after the sun. So the brightest non-star. <laughs> um, the reason for that is Enceladus is covered in ice, and so it just reflects the sun really good. We don't. It's hard for us to find a telescope from our planet just because it is so far away and so small. But when we run our like, you know, the telescopes we send out to space, these are pictures that we've taken of Enceladus, and it's, just, it's really bright because it reflects so much light. Cool thing about Enceladus, if you look at this little picture up in the top right corner, there's a giant geyser on the, on the south pole of Enceladus. It's spewing ice hundreds of miles into space, which then it kind of gets, gravity pulls it right back to Enceladus, and you kind of get this some of the pictures we have are really cool because I've seen some pictures where you see the debris kind of going out, panning out, and coming back. Um, but it is constantly spewing ice into space. So that means that Enceladus, in its core, is still very geologically active, extremely geologically active. Now, the problem with that is that its size, it should only be geologically active for maybe for hundreds of millions of maybe a billion years after it forms. But it had been formed with the rest of our system about four and a half billion years ago. So if it formed when our solar system formed, which is the way the model says it had to happen, it can't be geologically active at its size. But there it is, it's geologically active. Then you have Titan. Titan is the largest moon around Saturn. Titan, we, we believe, you know, this is from trying to get close-up pictures and everything, there is an atmosphere, and you can kind of see it in this photo, there's a bit of a blue haze around it. There's an atmosphere around Titan. We believe that atmosphere to be almost 100% methane. Um, and that's just, that's basically one of those things where that's kind of what it has to be, the way it formed and everything. We haven't tested it, gone down to, to measure it, but they figure it kind of has to be methane. Problem with that, again, is methane is, it degrades very fast in sunlight. And if it is nearly 100% methane, once that uh, atmosphere formed, it should have taken about 10 million years for the sun to burn it off completely. And it should have formed within several hundred million years of, it, of the planet forming. So that's kind of cons conservative estimate. Usually they think these atmospheres form in tens of thousands, at least the first primitive atmospheres. And this would be a pretty primitive atmosphere. Um, and so if it, let's say, the planet or the moon formed around four and a half billion years ago, maybe it takes about a half a billion years to form this kind of atmosphere and then burn it off. But here it is four and a half billion years later and we still see a, a atmosphere around it. And these are, you know, these are best guesses. These are best mathematical measurements we can get. There's no way to 100% prove all this, but it is the Big Bang model that says that that is nearly 100% methane. And it is, it is, Signs that, you know, the fact is we know that sunlight will burn off methane way faster, so that should not be there. So, a couple other interesting ones Uranus. So, Uranus is kind of cool because so the planets rotate or revolve around the sun in a counterclockwise motion, right? 
And because of that motion, that's got most of them in a counterclockwise rota uh, rotation of their own. <clears throat> the, there's two exceptions. Venus rotates clockwise, and so does Uranus. So they're rotating against their revolution around the sun. But Uranus, not only that, it is tipped on its side. So you think maybe rotation means it's rotating like a wheel around the sun, but it's rotating backwards going around the sun. Um, and I think they've tried to explain away the, the way that happens. I didn't get into that. I don't know why they think that it does that, but I just think it's cool because it's different than all the other planets. But what they have tried to calculate is how long it takes for a planetesimal to possibly grow into a planet. And you know the idea is as you get closer to the sun, those gas particles are denser fields, right? So those planets should be able to build faster because you've got more gas molecules to, to glom onto. So those planets should build fast. As you get farther from the sun, those gas fields should be much more dispersed. So planets can't form as fast. There's not as many gas molecules or much of that dust to collect. So the planets on the outside shouldn't get as big, at least not at the same speed. And here's the other problem, and they need to complete revolutions. Uranus, whoops, Uranus is about 1.8 billion miles away from the sun. It takes 84 years to get all the way around the sun for Uranus. So wherever Uranus was when we were born, until we're 84 years old, Uranus does not get back to where it started when we were born. So it takes 84 years for it to get around the sun. At that rate, <clears throat> Uranus should take about 10 billion years to get as big as it is by the Big Bang model. So going off of their model, <clears throat> it should take 10 billion years, but as we discussed, our system formed four and a half billion years ago. So they don't really have an explanation for how Uranus gets that big. And as you can imagine, if Uranus has that problem, Neptune is nearly three billion years, light years away from the sun. Or not, three billion miles, sorry. About three billion miles away from the sun. It takes it 165 years to complete a revolution. And that far out from the sun, you can imagine that there, if there is gas particles, gas fields around the sun, they're very much thinner out that far. So what we see are biggest planets further out from the sun. And our, the planets in our system that are closer are much smaller. And that's backwards from what the model says should happen. So, you know, a lot of those I can't say are as impossible as the way the stars form and the fact that something came from nothing. But it's still, we're really reaching here trying to figure out how this could go. How planets could form up. So the last couple, last couple issues about the Big Bang, then we'll move into evolution. Stars cause us more problems. So, the second the people came out and said, you know what, creation guys, you guys, you have a, a starlight problem. And that is that if we go out at night and we look, we point a star out that direction, we say it's 10 billion light years out that out that way, right? 10 billion light years, that's a measurement of distance. That's how far, you know, a light year is how far it takes light to travel in one year. So that means if we see a star that's 10 billion light years away from us, that light took 10 billion years to get to us. So that must mean it's been around for at least 10 billion years minimum, right? Does that make sense to everybody? For, for the fact that we can see the star, they're saying that means we must have, this planet, or at least that star, has to have been around at least 10 billion years. Therefore, we've proven that the universe is at least 10 billion years old. There's a couple issues with that. One is that oops, the speed of light, I keep it wrong, Speed of light has been shown to not necessarily be a constant that we believe it is. One, we have actually slowed it down in a lab setting. What we found out slows it down is gravity. Evidence of this is maybe you guys saw recently that almost all over Facebook and places, we got to film what we think is probably a black hole. I agree, it's probably a black hole. What's, you know, where they get their name? Well, look in the center, it's black, right? So a black hole is this spinning gravity well, right? It's, this, it's just this force of gravity drawing everything into it with more gravity than you can imagine. Any idea why it's black in the center? So much gravity, light can't escape. So there's probably something there. We can't see it though, because light's not getting out of it. Light's getting held in it because of the force of gravity in the black hole. So that tells us, you know, we still have a lot to learn about one, black holes, what we think it is, two, how it works, if it is. Um, 
but what we can at least see here is we've got some evidence to say, yeah, that probably if gravity gets that heavy, it can slow light down. So you spin that the other way. The, you know, they say, we see that the universe expanding. So there we interpolate that if you real time backwards, the universe should get smaller. Uh, so then they take that logic and they go to light and they say, well, if you slow it down with more gravity, then doesn't it stand to reason that you can speed it up by having less gravity? So it might be areas of space that have less gravity and light can smash it through it. So you can, you, we could go days just on that, but um, the, the idea just to get here across here is that light, speed of light is not necessarily constant. But there's actually a bigger problem. And that is that creation said, okay, well, if we've got a starlight problem, you've got what we call a horizon problem. And what that is, we have that star that's 10 billion light years that direction, right? We can go that direction, the opposite direction, see a star that may be 10 billion light years away. So now you've got 20 billion light years between those two stars. That creates a problem, and that is that mass cannot travel faster than light. By our laws of physics right now, mass cannot do that. So, and you and might say, well, you know, the light from that star probably hasn't reached that star because it's 20 billion light years and we're only 14 billion years old, so the light just hasn't reached. If you could stand at that star, you wouldn't see that one. Well, okay, fine. But at the same time, the universe is expanding, right? And actually, the shape they say it's expanding at is not just a nice, even, all directions. But even if it was, we'd have to be the center of the universe for these things because they could only travel if we're 14 billion years of light, 14 billion years old, then mass can only travel 14 billion light years at most. And now there's a problem because we also know that mass is spinning like this. So it's not just rocketing out that direction. So it can't go 14 billion light years that direction because it's doing this as it goes. And that means if it got 14 billion light years out there, as it's coming this way, it's going faster than light. <laughs> so we know that you cannot have that much distance between stars. And now how we measure stars distance from us to, that's something I wish I could describe more for you guys. I don't really understand it. I know a couple people that I really respect and they say, yeah, we think that we have a pretty good system of measuring by bouncing, you know, looking at it different stars trying to figure out how far each one is from each other. So I'll take some of those people on their word because I can, I know that there's, that the evidence is gonna show that, you know, what we have, what we see today we can't possibly have, and that is that these stars can't be that far apart. And the naturalists go, okay, yeah, you're right. So here we come back to that. It happened because it has to, but it couldn't, but it happened. So they say, well, the universe had to undergo a period of rapid expansion. That answers our, star, our, answers our horizon problem. There was a period where the universe had to expand faster than light. Well, it can't do that, but it did because it has to, but it can't, but it did because it has to. So that will keep going like that. But rapid expansion, as it turns out, let's give that some thought, because to me that sounds a bit like creation. We look at Isaiah 45, 12. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hand that stretched out the heavens, and I command all their host. Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Zechariah 12, 1. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. There's a cool website you can go to. If you Google, what does the Bible say about? And, and that's the website. You can fill in what you want to say about it. And it just pops, it just pops out verses, all it does. It doesn't try to give you advice. doesn't try to tell you what the verse means. It just pops out verses. If you put in that thing, what does the Bible say about stretched out the heavens? I got like 20 hits. So I don't know how many times in the Bible he says, I stretched out the heavens, but it seems to be a lot. That to me explains rapid expansion. So in a creation event, he stretched them out. That's all we get to know. So, but that seems to correlate with their rapid expansion idea. Basically they're admitting, it has to have suddenly done this. That's the only explanation. So just really quick to recap the logic of the Big Bang. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, 
uh, a guy that we all know and love, Stephen Hawking. I like to call him Secular Savior. Uh, he's the guy that, remember we talked about, he decided as far as how you get something from nothing, he looked at it mathematically. He looked at, imagine zero being nothing. And if you think of that on a number line, you could pull out a positive one. But if you do that, you end up with a negative one. So now the positive is all the mass in the universe, all the planets, the stars, the big things, the asteroids. The negative is all the gravity. That's why he was always so desperate to find black holes. Black holes don't prove evolution, don't prove Big Bang, but if there is no black holes, there's no Big Bang. So he was desperate to find them. But the deal is that the black holes are trying to bring all that back to zero, right? So there is your beginning, sort of, but the universe will have an end because it's going to get pulled all back together. Um, it just never began. It was always there. But so Stephen Hawking in a he was on a Discovery Channel program called uh, Did God Create the Universe? And when asked, he had this to say. He said, imagine a man wants to build a hill on a flat piece of land. The hill will represent the universe. So the flat piece of land is representing the nothing. Okay, you gotta imagine flat is nothing. So the hill will represent the universe. To make his hill, he digs a hole in the ground and he uses that soil to build his hill. But of course, he's not just making a hill, he's also making a hole. In effect, a negative version of the hill. The stuff that was in the hole has now become the hill, so that it perfectly balances out. So, right, you got the same amount of mass. That you, you put that hill back in the hole, then you go back to zero. This is the principle behind what happened right at the beginning of the universe. When the Big Bang produced a vast amount, a vast amount of positive energy, it simultaneously produces the same amount of negative energy. In this way, the positive and negative add up to zero always. It is another law of nature. So what does this mean? So I'm gonna go into that in a second, that last phrase, that last sentence. But uh, I like to, I put this picture up here. And some of you kids who are in Awanas, you already might know where I'm going, but this picture to me, basically, I don't know, it just blows away that whole first statement. Anybody kind of understand why? Stuff had to be there. What's that? Stuff had to be there initially. Well, stuff had to be there, yeah, yeah. to separate. So, yes, you, how you divide nothing into positive and negative, I don't know. Yeah. But there's something else about this. What I say science is? It's a tool, right? Yeah, it's a tool. Somebody has to operate it. How long do we gotta wait for that shovel to dig its own hole? <laughs> and make its own hill? <laughs> right. Is there an amount of time you can wait for nothing to divide itself into positive and negative? <laughs> no. He, there, there's, uh, this, he said himself, right at the beginning of his quote, imagine a man wants to build a hill. He didn't say imagine a hill wants to build itself. <laughs> he said right there, God had to start the universe. Yeah. However, if we continue on with this quote, so what does this mean? It means that if the universe adds up to nothing, then you don't need a God to create it. The universe is the ultimate free lunch. So does this sound like a guy that's after the truth? Or does it sound like a guy who's after disproving God? That's what atheism has become, new atheism. And that's, that's the four horsemen guys kind of started this off, but at least made it, brought it in the spotlight. Question. Yeah. I said the question. Yeah. Oh, did she have a question? No, I think oh, she was okay. pointing at you, so okay. I was back okay. there. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, uh, so how is it, because we know that a lot of the scientists are out for a certain outcome, yeah. how do we know that we can trust actually the stuff they're saying they're finding? I mean, I, I mean, it sounds terrible to say, in other words, like you're, you're, you look, look at, are looking at evidence as a Christian, right. as a creationist, we're looking at the evidence that, that they're giving us because we're not actually out doing this, studying the, uh, astronomy and all that stuff so we're still trusting them with you know what i mean because i guess in today's world where so many things can be manufactured um on the computer where you can make something look like it actually is real and say oh this is what we just discovered out in space blah, blah. and we have no idea we're just trusting them that this is what they actually found yeah and so anyway and i know some things are going against what they believe but other things are not and right. so that's why how do we it feels like they can just say anything and we'll just go oh, well we weren't there we didn't we're not the scientists, so yeah, how do we what They get that? wrapped up. So say you take something like the Big Bang, where you, where, you know, the logic says you can't have something from nothing. But then what they do is they start describing something like a peach epic, right? 
And it starts making sense because let's say that all the mass is in that peach. Well, you think, well, like, you can't get that much mass in that small space. Well, that's why it's burning in a trillion Kelvin. Because if you do mash all that mass into one space, it's going to have to burn in a trillion Kelvin or hotter to make it work. So, oh, okay, yeah, if it was burning that hot, then fine. We don't process that, you know, we, it, we got our answer and we move on to the next thing. And, and we do that. Yeah. And, and that's what happens in science. And that's what even happens um, you know, down at the bottom here. I'm going to halfway explain that too. Okay. Yeah. So, but yes, you are right. A lot of, you know, science, even the scientists, even the secular scientists are having to take a lot of this on faith. They don't like to say that. They say, well, we just know that humanity eventually is going to discover this and figure this out. They don't like to call that faith, but that is what it is. It's faith in humanity. Um, but yes, the thing is, like we discussed too, you're going to go in a direction you want to go. And just like you can make math and statistics say whatever you want to say, you can do that with scientific method. You can, you can ignore the results you don't want to see and keep pursuing the ones you do. And if it doesn't go right, you can tweak the little thing that you, that you say, well, that was insignificant. I just did this and I got what I wanted, but that was insignificant. I didn't do it. Yeah. You know, you, you, there's all kinds of things you can do with scientific method to make it go where you want it to go. Right. Make it say what you want to say. And I also don't want to give the impression that I think everything that they say about the star and everything they say about space is wrong. But we, they've discovered a lot. We know a lot about the, the universe, or at least our solar system. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there that we know to be real. But for me, what it came to at the end of the day, you've got to scrape away all the details, all the cool stories, everything that even, you know, all the details of what goes on. Just look at the base. My wife and I teach karate. And we know that it doesn't matter how hard you can hit something, right? If you're not on your feet right, you hit something real hard, you're going to knock yourself over. You've got to have a good base underneath you. Science with this stuff has to be the same way. You've got to have a solid base. Otherwise, the details just knock the base over. And that's what we've seen is... Because they don't have a solid base, they have all these things that just assumed had to happen because they have to happen to make everything else fit. They've knocked over common sense in lieu of their details. Yeah. It just to follow up on that. Yeah. Do you ever think though that the stuff that they're saying they find just is being found like the black hole stuff? Yeah. Because they need to have it. So in other words, how where do we? Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? That's one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that could be. I think for me, I'm kind of excited about what black hole could look like and could do. And, yeah. And uh, so I'm quick to, to believe that it could be real. Okay. I do have to say, though, I don't think there's enough evidence to say that, to prove that they're real. Right. But they make sense. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if everything else around it makes sense, then black holes have to make sense. Black holes are kind of the lesser end of the things that they are outrageous to, to accept. So, but yeah, if we continue on with Stephen Hawking here, he says, because there is a law such as gravity, and this is where we kind of get the why scientists are going in the wrong direction. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. The laws of gravity and quantum theory allow universes to spontaneously combust from nothing, or to appear from nothing, is what he said. To appear spontaneously from nothing. So, what's the problem with this statement? Well, one, he's not considering what nothing has got to be, but if we look at this, so before the creation of the universe, there would have been nothing. No laws of physics. So, there were no laws of physics to create anything, one. Two, a law of physics, can't, if they did exist, they can't create anything. They're just laws. And three, even if they did create a universe, what happened to the law of conservation of matter and energy, which says matter cannot be created or destroyed? So either way, he's got a circular argument that his own laws of physics that he has to abide by. If you accept a natural process to this, you have to abide by the laws of physics. Because the minute you step outside the laws of physics, which we do as creationists, yeah. but the minute you step outside the laws of physics, you are in the supernatural. When you're in the supernatural, you got to find an explanation for that. God's the only real explanation for that. So, but here's where scientists go wrong with Stephen Hawking. This is out of Proverbs 12, 19. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The wise man listens to advice. But that first half of that, this, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. These guys are so wrapped up in being the first to prove this, to prove that, the first to create this new philosophy, the first to come up with this new concept. They, you know, they want to make a new molecule and, and punch their ticket to Stockholm and be the guy that gets to receive the big prize. They're so wrapped up in this that they're not thinking it through. 
The other thing is this new atheism idea, which Stephen Hawking was kind of before the new atheism, but he was the kind of same same kind of guy. They're so wrapped up in thinking that we're ruining things, that as Christians we're slowing down humanity's progress, you know, technological progress, and so they're so wrapped up in that. They're so wrapped up in disproving, disproving what we believe that they forgot to look what's real, they forget to find truth. That that's what they're supposed to be doing. So the creationist view on all this, I've done a lot of time bashing the, the uh, secular view. How do creationists view this? Well, it's pretty simple. God created the universe. Uh, Psalms, I think it's 19.2, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. There's our explanation. Um, but look, let's, let's look back through how you study this. If you're attempting to find a natural secular origin of the universe, it is bound to observable laws of physics. You, you have to stay within those laws of physics. When we look out into the universe, we see some things that follow the laws of physics. We see some things that don't. Those things that don't follow the laws of physics, natural or the laws of physics, must be supernatural. God's only reasonable explanation for supernatural. And then I just always got to throw this in there because I, I want, I'll die on this hill. If we accept God, then we have to accept everything about Scripture. If you accept a God that created a created universe, you have to accept that God is perfect because whether you like it or not, it's his universe, it's his rules. He's perfect by definition. If you accept that, you've got to accept that I know that there are multiple translations of the Bible, but you have to accept that a God could make at least the base parts of his Bible what we need to hear. And so if you're going to accept creation, you accept all of it, you accept God. And it is, you know, the Bible's chock full of geography, of history, of science. It, it explains a lot. And there's a lot that, sorry, we don't get to know. As, as Christians, we've got to take it on faith. Um, same thing with the secular people, though. There's a lot of things they're going to take on faith. They just don't want to fess up to that. They don't want to face it. So that concludes the Big Bang. And the Big Bang is all ideas, right? There was nothing I could really talk about real evidence-based much because it's all ideas. It's all just kind of what makes sense to people. Certain things make sense to the secular naturalist. Certain things make sense to the creationist. As we start now moving into evolution, uh, it's going to get a bit more technical. There is a lot more evidence that we can actually study here on Earth and study to try to find the answers for this part of history, this part of our origins. So yeah, now we've explored some of the absurdity of the Big Bang, of the secular Big Bang, giving rise to evolution of our universe. Now let's try to explore the secular explanation of what came next, which is the coincidental combustion of life followed by random chance evolution. So again, we're still bound to random chance through all of this, and that's important to remember. Um, this slide is not real important, so this is just a picture with it, you know, a planet cooling at first in its first form. This is a timeline. We're going to go through this a bit more later. Uh, basically, the universe starts here at about almost 4 billion years. Our 14 billion years, sorry. Uh, our solar system starts about four and a half billion years ago. Life starts combusting about 3.8 billion years ago. It kind of hits these about three different extinction events, like ice ages, uh, before it finally then starts proliferating all at once into almost all the final that we see today. And then about 250 million years ago, the apes turn into man, and the rest is history. So the mainstream secular thought on how life begins. So this has been, at least since I was in school, so the mainstream things are kind of adjusting a bit now, as they will. But the idea is that all of the organic molecules for RNA, so for life, were just coincidentally in a mud puddle somewhere. Um, we know those things won't go together on their own, so it probably got hit by lightning, which combusted RNA. RNA then gives way to DNA, which then gives way to the proteins that help them. Um, and pretty soon we have a single cell organism. That was pretty far fetched, so they had to come up with something to support it. And there was a evidently a cataclysmic event shortly after Earth formed, where a moon-sized object brushed off of Earth, just nicked us. It couldn't hit us head on because we wouldn't be here today. But it nicked us, but that made that object explode. And it basically, I'm gonna read here, so I'm gonna quote it. So a cataclysm may have jump started life on Earth. A new new scenario suggests that some four four and a half billion years ago. In your 60 million years after Earth formed and took shape, 
and 40 million years after our moon formed, a moon-sized object sideswiped Earth and exploded into an orbiting cloud of molten iron and other debris. Basically what I was going to say is that iron then gave away the certain kind of atmosphere, which then allowed for the biological, for the organic molecules to start forming. Because one, you got to have organic molecules before they can form into RNA. So this, this gives them the atmosphere they need to form, and you get simple molecules, um, and so then you get RNA, and we're going to see in a few more slides too that they like to use the word in RNA world because it had to be RNA first, they think, and then they'll backtrack. But, so this was Robert Service or Bob Service. He's a he's a new a new atheist is what he would consider himself. So kind of spawn off of the four horsemen of atheism, um, and you know he's trying to lend a hand to the fact that our mainstream ideas really get chewed apart. So to go forward a little bit here, you need to understand a little bit about what DNA, RNA, and these transfer proteins are. So when your cells replicate, right, when they divide and they reproduce, DNA has to replicate, it has to copy itself. RNA is kind of the, the trick of that. So we've all seen like the double helix that DNA, pictures of this that DNA makes, right? And you have all these little nucleotides, adenine, adenine and thymine like to join up, thymine and line like to join up, and that's what these little bridges are across the double helix, is those, those things, like the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's that are on there. But what happens is, a DNA strand will unzip, in essence, and then RNA gets carried in and, and plugs on the DNA, right? And it's only certain ones to match. So adenine has to match with thymine, thymine thiazine has to match with, with uh, guanine. And so whatever's sticking out here when the DNA unzips, the RNA knows which one to plug on there. And then what happens when it's all done, that RNA releases, flips around and joins, and you have like a new strand of DNA, right? And the original DNA just sits back together. And you have to have what they call different types of transfer proteins to make the RNA move around. Because RNA can't shuttle itself, it has to be shuttled by the proteins. So, and then the RNA now is, can become new DNA. It could shuttle more information off out of, this, out of the nucleus of the cell, take it to different things. And the RNA, there's different types of RNA do different functions. But uh, the main thing to think about here is RNA cannot function without the proteins moving around. Proteins cannot exist without DNA to code for them. And DNA can't exist without RNA to code for it. So you've got this circular thing where none of these three things can exist without the other. And then they're going to kind of open to that. But uh, let's take that one step further and realize that even if you had these three things, so these three things would have to spawn at the same time, right? The RNA, the DNA, and the transfer proteins. They would have had to all come together. We're talking about thousands of, of proteins. And proteins, just one protein itself, is a giant molecule. A lot of atoms in a protein, they're huge. And so the idea that they could all come together at the same time is pretty far-fetched. But even if they did, those three things can't survive without a nucleus to protect them. So now they have to code for a nucleus and have a nucleus spawn at the same time. The nucleus isn't gonna survive in the environment without the entire cell to protect it. An entire cell can't function unless it has all the other organelle in a cell. And we're going to kind of go through what those organelles, you know, <coughs> basically what they are. The basic gist of this, and we're going to get to where they try to do math and try to figure out the cause of this, but you have to have the entire cell spawn at once. And so you have to have all those, all those proteins, all those molecules, everything in one place at one time, which a lot of them don't like each other. They'll run away from each other. They're not compatible, like water and oil. Like if you poured water and oil together, Put it in a glass, put some water in it, pour some oil on top, you stir it up, and it takes it moments to completely separate. You'll have the oil on top and water on the bottom. That's what a lot of stuff in RNA will do. It's left to its own biases. A lot of it also will react. So if you have a chemical reaction, that means two or more things come together, react, and you have something new. So now you don't even have the right stuff for RNA. That's why this stuff will never spontaneously combust, even if you can get it to exist all together in one place. So this comes also out of Bob's service. He says, life as we know it likely emerged from an RNA world. So again, he's saying RNA would have had to come first. Many researchers agree on this. In modern cells, our DNA, RNA, and proteins play vital roles. DNA stores the aerial information, so it's your instruction manual. RNA ferries it inside the cell, so the RNA is the stuff that can actually copy and take the DNA and do things with the DNA. Uh, and 
protein the servers that handle the workforce. Is there what's moving the RNA around through this function? Um, again, it's very simplified, but that's basically what happens. Um, the production of each of those biomolecules requires the other two. So he's admitting we can't have RNA unless I have DNA and proteins too, the transfer proteins. Uh, yet the idea that all three complex molecules arose simultaneously seems implausible. I throw that quote in there because I like that word implausible. Yeah. I think impossible is really more accurate. So, you know, I am a friend of Boyle who is a creationist. So we got to remember he does have a bias toward creation. Most of the guys I'm quoting are secular people. But this guy's a creationist. He did some calculations, and what he what he tried to do was figure out, you know, the simplest cell we know of is a bacterial cell. It takes about 2,000 proteins different proteins and proteases to make this thing. He's hypothesizing is Fred Hoyle, oops, is Fred Hoyle that you could really theoretically have a cell that's only 400 proteins and proteases and whatnot. We haven't ever seen that, but he's thinking a cell probably could survive that smaller number. So he's being generous here to say, really we could do it with just this few. So maybe that's what happened in the beginning. But what are the odds of that happening? So he's saying you take a you take all of the, the materials that we know of as in a cell, and we know this because we can mass spec it, we can look at all of the individual atoms that's in a, in a in a material. So we know what's in there. If you took all those things, put it in a petri dish, and tried to let them spontaneously combust together. And if we did this, so oh this isn't the one that talk, talks about the time it takes you, but he's saying that process. The odds of that happening is about one to 10 to the 40,000th power. I don't know how many people agree with this, but I haven't seen it challenged. Um, 40,000, now we talked last week about the odds of the universe coming together being one to 10 to the 123rd. So if we throw that number into that thing, <laughs> uh, we're already astronomical and now we get way farther astronomical. So, I think I better stop here. I was hoping to get through cloning today, but we'll wait until next week. Because um, the next thing is, well, if we can clone, how can we say we can't put the pieces of life together? It's important to understand what cloning is. Cloning is, cloning is not creation. And I'll go through that next week. But they'll, they like to say that. They like to say, well, of course you can create life. You can take the pieces and make life. We do it with cloning. We do it all the time. And we'll talk about what cloning really is. I have some charts from, oops from these guys at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Institute. So these are the sector guys telling us what cloning is, and you'll find out that it's nothing more than normal birth, just they might take some of the process out, out of the out of the host and put it back. But anyway, we can't create. We can copy, and we're actually pretty terrible at that. Um, so yeah, we will stop there. We'll talk about what cloning is and move on into uh, evolution. Um, I'm sorry if some of this is going to get pretty sciencey when we talk about. Or we'll get through this DNA stuff fairly soon, and then we'll go for a little bit. I'm going to put you into radiometric dating, which is going to then require some chemistry. But um, so hope that don't bore you too much. But uh, this is the stuff where we can really come up with the evidence. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.